Hi there. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tinnitus TV. Today, I'm talking to Dennis Ellsworth and Leroy Stagger. You know, some albums are timely, others are timeless. But Modern Hope, the latest full length from Ellsworth, manages to be both. As you might gather from that optimistic title, the prolific PEI singer-songwriter spends much of the disc trying to find light in the darkness that threatens to engulf our world. Interestingly, he sets those of-the-moment sentiments against a backdrop inspired by the sound and style of classic British folk. We're talking finger-picked nylon string guitars, hushed vocals, and a gently mellow vibe. But this is no period piece, Thanks primarily to the talents of Alberta Troubadour, producer, and longtime friend Leroy Stagger, who adorns Ellsworth's elegant work with ambient, psychedelic flourishes and other technical wizardry that places the album in a sonic landscape all its own. It's no wonder that Modern Hope has earned Ellsworth his latest East Coast Music Award nomination. To mark the occasion, Ellsworth and Stagger zoomed in from their respective homes to discuss their musical bromance, keeping hope alive, their next moves, and much more. Enjoy. All right, guys. Well, we we are uh, here today to talk to uh, both of you about uh, Dennis's new album, uh, Modern Hope. Um, from what I am told, you guys are our are, are old friends, right? Yeah, we've yeah. been friends for... Um... For well, well over a decade, I guess now. Um, once, once we walked into uh, the Carlton Bar in uh, in Halifax, and uh, the late um, um, what's his name, Jay? The late, what's his name? Jay Last Smith. Name? Yeah, Jay Smith. The late Jay Smith uh, looked. He was sitting beside Matt Mays, and he looked up. And as me and Dennis walked in the club, he he goes. Well, if it isn't the two crustiest songwriters in all of Canada, <laughs> and Dennis had to, Den, Dennis had to explain to me that that was actually a compliment. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah, I was getting ready to swing up on him. <laughs> so where? Yeah, did you, I, I think where we met. You... We met like in 2011, I think, or 12. Okay. Yeah. At a yeah. at a show somewhere, I'm guessing, or. Well, Leroy actually uh, reached out to a guy I was working with at, at one point. Uh, I think Leroy just made two records and it signed to, uh, what was it, Jake Gold's label, I think? Danny, no, uh, Danny Goldberg. Da yeah, no. Danny Goldberg, Jake, Jake Gold's the hip guy, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, Danny Goldberg's label. Uh, and he was looking to come out to the East Coast. Uh, and you reached out to Jeff Liberty. And Jeff Liberty got in touch with me and said, you should talk to this Leroy fella. So we had a chat and uh, figured out some some ways to play some shows. And we've been kind of doing that on and off for years now, whenever, yeah. whenever it makes sense. And then the invitation to make this record came. And, uh, you know, we'd already talked about that to some degree, but it was just kind of an idea, you know, nothing really concrete. And then the uh, everything fell into place, and here we are. So it took you. Why did it take you ten years to 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 make an album together? <laughs> well, I guess, I guess yeah. Go ahead, and you can answer that, Dennis. I, I was just gonna say. I mean, that's just kind of how long it took us. You right, know, we're sometimes slow. we're slow. We're a part of the slow <laughs> movement. The slow movement. Yeah. <laughs> make no album before it's time. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think it also just came down to finances and opportunity uh, popped up where it was going to um, we were going to have some funding to make a, to make a record together. And uh, I, you know, I I shot around the idea. Dennis was was sending me songs and I think um, I started kind of giving him some homework on these songs. I said, what if you kind of made a, a record that sound or what if you wrote a song that kind of had this feel or that reminded us of this and we kind of went back and forth uh and kind of kept landing on 60s and 70s british folk singer songwriters like and especially nick drake um 
and we kind of discussed like nobody there's not a lot of people making records that sound like that i would like i guess laura marlin kind of comes to mind um and dennis dennis's voice lends itself so well to that era uh and then he he then of course the floodgates open and he just sent me song after song and and to to the point where i said okay enough like you got to stop because we got enough songs to make a record here <laughs> when you're writing in that in that vein or trying to write in, in a certain vein i mean it, how do you approach that i mean because when i think of uh say north american folk versus british folk i mean one is more extroverted one is more introverted but is, is it does that translate into the way you write a song or does it what comes comes and then you kind of fit it into that vein or what yeah i mean i don't really know i i happened to have i was listening to a lot of that stuff anyway um you know sandy denny and john martin uh and bert yanch and just, just that kind of vibe so i was sort of already thinking in those terms like i guess but lyrically you know i think that the lyrics were just sort of born out of the times like the i i i felt finally like and maybe it was because i was working with lee but i felt like maybe i should say something about the way things are <laughs> instead of just writing another love song you know what i mean um so i i tried that and i wrote moving to space and it just kind of set the tone for for whatever came next and it, it, it i didn't have to think about it again i just kind of kept uh letting things flow so it, it felt kind of organic which i mean in in the end the whole record the whole process felt pretty organic right. it didn't feel super labored or anything like that it was it was played live it was written really quickly um so the, the the process for writing to to try to find a way to fit into the little boxes that we created for ourselves um it was difficult at first and i remember leroy saying like it went it went from leroy saying okay dennis we need some songs to leroy saying okay no more songs stop because <laughs> i couldn't write that i couldn't find what i wanted to say at first and i I think I initially sent Leroy a couple of like scrappy little instrumental things. I'm like, how about these? And he's like, yeah, I mean, those are cool, but where's the words? So it took me some time. Um, but once I, once I started to live in that little world that we made uh, for it, then it all just sort of happened naturally, which was lucky, I think. But um, to me, I don't know. I mean, to me, Dennis, there is something like really late night and weary, like kind of weary about this, the way the words presented themselves for this record. And I think that like I would get demos from you at like two, three in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of felt like there was that really late night um, laboring over some of these lyrics that kind well, of lend itself to the to the record. And I think that that was actually really unique. Yeah, it does have that vibe. Um, are, are, is well, that... They, were, they were all written at, at t after 10 o'clock, between 10 o'clock and 1.30 or 2 in the morning. Your kids you are know, in bed, and... you've got time, right? Exactly. But I had to be quiet, too. So I was, I was hushed. And that also set the tone for the delivery, uh, but also sort of the sentiment. Right. In, in terms of the, the you talking about you know, uh, having uh, it, it being slow at first and then picking up speed and it all just coming out. Is that typical for you? Because, I mean, you seem like a pretty prolific guy. Is it, is it, uh, are you one of those people who can just turn the, the songwriting spigot on and off at will? So the short answer is yes, I can. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm asked to write songs for, say, my publisher, I could write a song. Right. But is it a song I'm ever going to sing? I don't think so. So if it's songs that I want to present myself, they take time. They come in waves. I can um, I can sit down and try a couple of times and fail. And then one day I get one. And then the next three weeks I get a bunch. So this was you know, fairly typical for you then in terms of that process. 
Yeah, but sometimes the lull can last a really long time, and then it's a really intense short period. Uh, but you know, during that lull, I could write songs for my publisher if he said, "I need this kind of song," or "I want you to co-write with this person." I can get in a room and write a song any day of the week, but I don't, uh, I don't connect to those songs the way that I do with the ones that are on this record that right. came that that other way. Um, in terms of 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 writing the music um again was that sort of different because i i hear north american folk music as being kind of you know three chords and strumming and and whereas that british thing kind of grows out of the you know the medieval green sleeves uh <laughs> balladry different keys different chords more finger picking is that something you're conscious of while you're writing or 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 not yeah, I think that we, like as we said, we sort of made that call that we were going to go for that. Yeah. Now, now, just because we said that doesn't mean that I'm going to nail it. So I think that there's like a bastardized version of what we were talking about here. But, okay. but luckily, I was listening to that music a lot, and I was starting to write more in open tunings mm -hmm. uh, and finding finding melodies in the parts themselves. Um, so this, the, the songs were written um, in mostly What's open tunings. I think there's only two songs on the record that are in standard yeah. tuning. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, I tried to put myself into that world. Um, and, but, but luckily I wasn't copying. I was just trying to do something yeah. th that I admired my own way, you know, like. Right. We were going so it ended we were going on a feeling, uh, less of a case study and more of a feeling. Right. hundred percent. So then yeah. when you, when, when it comes time to go into a studio and then turn these things into recordings, as opposed to just songs, um, how, how did that, how did that manifest itself with the two of you working together like this in this sort of new way for the first time? Well, Dennis kind of put his faith in me to kind of just make it happen, which was which was great. And that's kind of my favorite way to work. It's not that I need to have total control, but I do want to get what I had a vision. I th it's not like a complete vision, but mm. when any anytime I'm producing for an artist, I'll have a vision of how the feeling of the record should be. Um, so, you know, I had, I think my studio had just, been destroyed so we had booked out of a, a studio that i love to work out of called afterlife in vancouver um which is the old mushroom studio so there's plenty of history in that studio um i love the engineers and the band that i picked um for dennis's record was a band that i'd worked with lots uh before in iterations of my groups and my records and um and the space is just great and uh, so you know, I, I, I was rarely, I rarely get to just be the producer. Uh, I'm usually engineering and producing. And, and in this case, I got to just produce and trust, you know, John to capture it the way I like to capture it. And then I mix it after, but um, also I was in the room, I think for the majority of the record, just sitting on a stool in the room with the band with headphones on listening Um and it it kind of just turned into exactly how I wanted it without trying to control it. I put all of the musicians in one room, except for Dennis was off to the side, I believe, so that we did, or he was in a little ISO room off to the side so that a lot of the bleed wouldn't get into his microphone because he was singing live takes and playing live takes, um, which is, if I can record that way, I will, but you don't, uh, you don't normally get a singer who's going to nail and play the takes, sing and play this, the takes live and, and get finished takes. But it was obvious that that was happening with Dennis right away. And I, and I'm, I'm still blown away that he was able to do that, have a young baby at home and fly across the country and just show up and start nailing takes. It was, it was a pretty like magical um, thing for me as a producer and a engineer to kind of witness, but you know, it's nothing, it's nothing too crazy production wise. It was actually like a real old school approach to, to recording the record. Dennis just showed up and, and did his thing and was totally prepared and 
the band just created magic around it. So do the songs, yeah. uh, Dennis, do the songs uh, on the record sound the same as the songs you heard in your head or have they taken a big, you know, trip? No, they, no, you know, like uh, usually if I, if I make a demo or something, it changes a lot. Um, but you can listen to the voice memos that I sent Leroy like minutes after I completed the song and, and did the roughest take I could. And they're fairly close. You know, there's real, we didn't do a ton of editing. Um, we sort of let the songs live the way that they were born. Uh, and maybe that's because they were so fresh. We didn't have a lot of time in between me finishing writing the record and us getting together to make it. So we sort of, we just let them be what they were, but we, as Leroy, indicated we played live yeah. um, and I remember when we did when we were starting and we were doing takes I think we would just sort of go over the song maybe two two or three times in the room together and then we would start tracking uh, and capturing takes and I I don't think we did any more than three or four takes of either song or any no, song I don't think so it was I, some of them some of them were first takes I think yeah I really wanted to capture the fragility of those demos and that late night feel um that I mean you know Daryl I'm sure you noticed the the softness of his voice the quiet singing yeah um that was important to me to capture uh in a war in an era of everything is so big and so fake and and produced and auto-tuned um, I wanted to capture the the little blue little robin's egg that you know that I found on in the demos and just I wanted to to bring that out and and uh, that just lended it lent itself to 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 capturing it live off the floor like that and Afterlife is full of vintage mics and vintage gear and and it was just such a treat to work out of there. Yeah, mm. I, you know, I, I've talked to other artists about this. Um, do you think that the that working on that kind of gear, working on those, you know, old school instruments and doing things in, in that way. Um, th does that affect the music? Uh, not only, I mean, not just the sonics of it, but the way you play it and the way it comes out, you know, does that, could you make the same album on brand new instruments yeah. and, 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 and digitally and all that, you know? I think, um, I think you can. You know, mm -hmm. I think you can. I think that it's a luxury uh, and we're privileged to be able to work with that kind of gear on on this particular record. Um, I mean, yeah, I think I honestly do think you can. Um, you know, I can make a record on anything. I could make a record on cheap gear and have it sound great. It's mm -hmm. about the people in front of the microphones to me. I think that the, sure. the vintage gear is just a luxury. <laughs> Yeah, there, there were a few choices we made too about the instruments that we were using, you know, like Jeremy had a, a double bass and he played an electric bass. So, you know, on certain songs, it needed the double bass. Um, and then I played a nylon string guitar the whole time. I didn't have a steel string guitar once in my hand for that whole session. Yeah, uh, and 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 that was what I wrote those songs on. So Leroy said, make sure you bring that because that's kind of the tone. Um, um, but I, I, as far as the vintage versus new thing, like I think Leroy is right. You could make this record with the new gear and it's more about the people, but it also comes down to some of those little nuances, just like, you know, a nylon string guitar over a steel string guitar. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and you know, lyrically, obviously modern hope is, is the title. There's hope in the lyrics. What what is what is this hope thing you talk about, and and how in God's name do you have hope in in these days? Well, I think I have it because I have to have it. You know what I mean? I don't ever want to really let it go, uh -huh. uh, because once you do, what what are you doing? You know, you got to be able to see some sort of a uh, a light through all that shit, and that's just the way it is. And it and, and it can be on a micro level, or it could be on this macro level that we're seeing now, and it's. You know, you still have to you still have to look your kids in the eyes and and smile. You can't just be a bummer, um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, but if you think about what I'm saying in these songs, a lot of them are rooted in the bummer side of things. But I'm just sort of looking at it from a way of um, just with that little glimpse of hope, which is kind of what we have right now. 
you know, because that's about all we can muster. <laughs> There's a great Patty Smith quote that I hang my hat on a lot. And it, and she says, um, I'm an optimist because what's the point of the other thing? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, I mean, you guys are both, you know, kind of DIY guys. You, you, you generally are, I think, you know, people who will play multiple instruments yourself, produce yourselves, you know, so uh, giving that the, the control over to each other is kind of a uh, kind of a new thing for you. Were you um, concerned that, you know, this might not work or or did it did it work better than you anticipated it working in terms of, you know, pairing up like this? Yeah, I mean, for well, me, who wants I, to go first? I'll, I'll go yeah. first. I think um, I as a producer, I, I tend to like some a little bit of control, but in a in a uh, in a democratic way. Um, but I think me and Dennis are alike in so many ways that we strive to let go of a lot of things. So I think it's a symbiotic relationship especially with the two of us, you know, we, we, we've written songs together. Um, I've got two of Dennis's songs on my record that's coming out in September. And um, we never really butt heads too, too much on, on lyrical choices or anything like that. And I think it's, we both respect each other enough to just to trust in each other's tastes. So for me, there's no, there was no, um, it was not, it was not hard at all to, to work with Dennis in any, in any capacity. I'm such Ooh. a fan. I'm such a fan of his writing and his singing that it just, I was, I just kept kind of looking around the room and going, I get, wow, this is my job. This is incredible. It was special. Yeah. And I was feeling the same things, but you know, from my side of things, when I make a record and I hire a producer, I'm hiring that producer because I trust them. I want to work with them. I want their ideas. I don't want to tell them what to do. That would be pointless. Um, and, you know, having Leroy as the producer this time, in in some cases, I've worked with people I've never met them before. But we have a long history together. And there's, like Leroy said, it's a symbi symbiotic relationship. We trust each other. We respect each other. We love each other's writing. I had no reservations about this process. I was so comfortable going into it um i was probably worried more about would i be able to do this live off the floor like i used to do because i hadn't made a record like that in a while hmm. but it was it was so easy once we got started because the players that leroy put together were just the best and you know we if you if he gave a reference they nailed it within 30 seconds you know it was it was just so easy and I wouldn't say that it was easier or better than I expected because I expected that it would be great. Um, but it was really uh, an enjoyable session. And we had five days booked and we canceled the last day because we recorded 13 songs in four days. So it, it was a it was a real uh, organic experience. And um, I don't think there was a single decision out of place. like. Even yeah. right down to Leroy's mixes. When he started sending me the mixes, immediately they were bang on. And then more I listened to them and pick up, I, I kept sending him messages like a year after we recorded the record and he had delivered me mixes just to remind him like how much he nailed these mixes because they just sound so good. Um, and I kept on hearing things that I didn't hear the last time, which I love personally uh i think that that lends that makes this record something that people will continue to discover uh it's not frivolous it's not superficial it's there's some yeah well i mean that's kind of inherent some depth yeah that's inherent in the songwriting and the sounds i mean as you were talking about leroy it's not a it's not the kind of album that that you know stomps up to you and and smacks you in the face it's 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 understated and subtle and it it draws you in and and yeah. keeps you coming back for more um, so is this is this an experience that the two of you would like to repeat going forward or or would that be gilding the lily? I'll do I it anytime. This, <laughs> I have this um I have this guilt or this um this selfish concept of a record 
that I haven't really talked to Dennis about, but I know he, um, I like, you know, when I hear, <clears throat> when I hear Dennis's voice and his writing, um, I, I, I've heard him like croon before and I, and I, I secretly want to do like a real, uh, sixties and early seventies, like Neil Diamond style record with Dennis with like the horns and the like real groovy um thing so that's i mean if we can if we can find someone to pay for it that's i what i think is next on the list well that's that's the magic uh, trick isn't it the sixty four thousand yeah. dollar question yeah 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 well, i so, think we could figure that out i mean i know a few people who'd be pretty happy to hear a record like that and i'd love to make one and yeah. i think the the only other time that Leroy and i talked about making a record together he said to me you got to come out to my place and we'll make a real rock and roll record and then we finally got to, we finally got together to make a record we made the softest one in in my catalog <laughs> the anti-rock and roll record yeah. yeah exactly yeah that's that's the way it goes so you got yeah. nominated for uh, an East Coast Music Award for this one. Um, I, do you already have a few of those? Don't you? No. This is this is the first time. I've been nominated before, but I've never okay. won anything. Yeah, and, you know, and, and not nominations really all that matters it, to me. I don't really mind if I lose. <laughs> <laughs> we're good losers. Yeah. Know, we're we're the best losers around. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe maybe the title turn on this one. Um, so so Leroy, you mentioned uh, a new album in September. Can what can you tell us about that? It's the third time that I've made it. Um, <laughs> okay. I've heard all three. Yeah, Dennis I've heard, heard all, three. all three. That bodes uh, well. I've, I've gone literally to mastering on every version. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've got a record. It's great. I, I'm proud of it. It's um, like I said, it's got two of Dennis's t songs. One that we that he, he, I kind of added a, a verse to and one that he wrote with me in mind. And as soon as I heard the demo, I thought, well, yeah, this is great. I'm going to tweak it. And um, I was re a really kind of uh, interested in 90s rock and roll, um, Lemonheads, uh, Replacements. And the record kind of has some of that pastiche to it, I guess. Um, and it's kind of it's the first record that I I mixed myself. I've tried it before, and have never been able to pull it off. I just get too weirded out with doing my own work, so I'll pass it off to somebody. And I almost did. Joel Plaskett was hanging out at the studio quite a bit near the end of things, and he was interested in the record and and was guiding me on some stuff. And he said, "You know, why don't we take this to to uh, to my studio and we'll let Tom Thomas do his thing and." I almost did it. And I was like, I looked at him like, I have to see this through. <clears throat> and I'm really, really glad I did. i um, very proud of it. So, you know, it's just, it's a piece of work that, that I like. And um, some of so the, you folks, made the rock record. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I did. I suppose I did. <laughs> well, I look forward to that. It's, it's a, it's a great record. And it, and it, and it would all the time that you took to make, through this whole process you know making the record three times and getting to where you got to it was totally worth it i mean yeah, it's thanks. it's a lot of work but it's a great record when yeah. you say making it three times are you saying you recorded the say the songs three times yeah so kind of yeah actually um so there was one record that is finished that yeah so that version of it was made and then I wanted to do, I kind of had it in my mind to do this time out of mind style recording. And actually it was based a lot on Dennis's record. So I actually went to Afterlife and had a seven piece band live off the floor in the room, um, no headphones. So then I made that version of the record and I, th and it's great. And they will all probably come out on in their own time. And then, um, and that one was going to be the record. And then I handed it into management. And one of the managers said, this is great, Leroy, but this is like a real introspective bedroom record. There's no singles. There's no bangers. And and if we're going to conquer these new markets, we need some singles. So then I frustratingly threw my arms up in the air, you know, after this is the second time I'd made this damn thing um, and went and, you know, reluctantly wrote some bangers if you will 
and tried to put them in with that sequence. And I was like, this doesn't work at all. So I went back to the drawing board and re-recorded, wrote, a, wrote some new songs, re-recorded a bunch, took some mixes from, took some versions of the first recording that had, you know, Pete Thomas on drums wow. um, and remixed them into this new thing. Like this, like I mentioned, like a real, not, I kind of, it's just, it's just a feeling, right? It's for me as a producer and a mixer, it's about a feeling. It's not about a case study. It's not about me wanting to sound like this. It's just a feeling of those great Lemonheads records and the great, um, you know, even Joel's Plaskett's earlier records and, and just, you know, this feeling of this raw roughness. Um, I'm really trying to move away from the, the modern sounds of, um, of the, the records that the times that were in and uh so yeah that's kind of where i went with it and does it have a title ways, yeah it's called i yeah 3 a.m revelations okay yeah nice. yeah yeah I was, I was gonna say if that does, if you didn't have one you should go with bangers if you will <laughs> hi esme look hello hi hi yeah and Daryl, we're just having a conversation. I'll be done in a few minutes, okay? <laughs> yeah, so I'll I'll make sure I'll get you a copy. Oh, definitely. I look forward to that. Yeah, and and, and Dennis, have you already written the next album? I've recorded two more. Two more. <laughs> yeah, I have I, I have a record that I made basically uh started in late 2022. Um, and finished it in, it took about a year and three trips to Ottawa. Uh, I made a record with Jim Bryson and that, I don't know when that one will come out. It's fully mixed and everything. It hasn't been mastered and I'm still picking away at one that I'm making here in PEI with a longtime collaborator of mine named Adam Gallant. Mm. Uh, we, we made common senseless and most of the bound by love records were made to i made with him um so we're we're still working on that uh it's kind of slow going and we keep if this is a process similar to what leroy just discussed about his you know we're not throwing too much away but we're not settling for what we don't uh love you know what i mean like if, mm -hmm. if it's not something that is that really belongs there, or if it's not the right combination of things, we're being really hard on ourselves and, and either working on something until it's finished the way we want it to be, or we do set it aside and, and who knows if we'll ever get back to it. But, you know, it, it could end up just being an EP at this point. You know, it depends on how much more we want, we want to put into it. And clearly I don't need to put any more records out right now. So but it's just as I'm always recording. I'm always writing stuff and, and recording stuff, but I don't know when any of that will come out. Um, we'll see if tonic wants to be involved in that stuff. I hope they do, but I don't really know. Um, but you know, right now I'm just kind of, I want to go out and play modern hope a bit and, um, and let people give people some time with that one because I think that it's really special. So do you want to go out and do that with a band? I mean, obviously the, the economics with that are probably prohibitive. Well, I mean, it was only a four piece band in the studio. It, we would probably need one extra person to be like an auxiliary player. Huh. Um, so I think we could probably do it as five. And I, I would like to play uh, some shows with a band outside of my region. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll fly West and collect the people that made this record with me and play it live sometime. I really don't know. Uh, uh, right now I have a one and a half year old son, so I'm not doing a ton of touring, but, um, you know, probably by the end of this year or early next year, I'm going to start getting back out there and playing more shows. Right. Uh, I, guys... I, I need it. Mm -hmm. And I just needed a little rest. Right. Yeah. Well, understandable. Um, you know, talking about, about all the music you, you guys make, do you both have like just hard drives full of songs that haven't found a home yet? 
Yeah, we. I can answer for both of us. I know that we both do because I hear I hear a lot of Dennis's songs <laughs> that he sends me, and yeah, I do, I do as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're both studio rats, so uh, we record ourselves. We have I've had a, I've owned a studio for years. Dennis right. has um, you know, space, and he works out of Adam's studio a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, we do. You know, it's just that's just what we do. We're kind of we come from that lineage of songwriters where we write we write all the time some of it's good some of it's not good some of it's absolutely horrible but you know i know you gotta write the bad ones to get the good ones if only we could if only we were as good as at social media and marketing as we are prolific at writing songs we'd probably be a lot more famous than we are (laughs) well that's the trick yeah Got to get, uh, got to yeah. get rid of the beards and learn some dance moves, guys. Yeah, yeah. If only <laughs> well, we didn't, like, if only we didn't listen to Nick Lowe so much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> are you? Yeah. Uh, are you? Is he, uh, is he touring? Is that Ron Sexsmith tour coming your way? Nick and it Ron. Uh, out in Vancouver. No. I don't know if it's coming east. No. I think he's. They're only doing four or five shows, and they seem to be in the middle of the country. Yeah. Well, they're yeah. coming. They're coming to my. Uh, they're coming to Winnipeg, so I'm there for sure. Oh, lucky. Yeah. So, you know, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is, is, you know, when you guys write so much, and this always fascinates me about, about uh, musicians, especially when you, because you have to work so far ahead on things. And like you said, you've made two albums since that one. And, and Leroy, I'm sure you, as you said, you've got hundreds of things. I'm always amazed that you guys can um, still summon the enthusiasm because I, 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 for, for, for something that's, you know, as old as, as things are before you release them. Because I imagine, like most artists, you're 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 in love with the album you're making right now, or in love with the album that you're writing and are going to make next. And you know, but you still have to kind of go, oh yeah, right, those that thing we did two years ago, yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. You know, in this yeah. in the case of Modern Hope, though, like I don't know, we sure we made the record over two years ago. Actually, it was about two years ago, right now. Yeah. Um, but like I said before, it's to me, it feels like such a special record on so many levels. Uh, I was just so proud of it. I, I'm proud of the way that we made it. So it's easy to get excited about the things that I'm working on now, but I'm still excited about Modern Hope just because there's special. a there's some there's something special about it. And I feel like slowly people are discovering that. And yeah. that's OK with me. I mean. Like Leroy said, social media is not our forte. I can't remember the last time that I posted anything meaningful on social media. <laughs> um, I'm not a content creator in that sense. I feel like that's a part of the industry that I just can't get behind. But uh, I'll keep writing songs. So that's, you know, to get excited about those, sure. But I'm still really excited about Modern Hope because of, of how special it is. Uh, I was ruminating on this this morning. Actually, I re- I worked up a big piece of writing that I'll post on my Substack. But um, I think that this is probably uh, the last time. Knock on wood, because but this is probably the last time I'll I'll wait around for a record. I just can't do it anymore. It doesn't it doesn't work for me. Um, much to my manager's dismay, but I just can't do it. I think, and it, we're living in times where I I want to make a record and put it out the next day. Mm-hmm. And we can do that. We can do that. And, you know, and the marketplace is different. I can go out and sell the record uh, off the stage. And I mean, I, I seem to be touring less and less, um, but um, that's kind of uh, how I want to work. Um, I feel like the old model is is dis- disappearing. Yep. Um and uh you know I just my buddhist texts and books tell me that that's what things do they change and I think that yep. um the business of it is 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 not the business of of old and I think it's time for me to come to grips with my truth which is that I don't I, I don't want to wait anymore. I don't want to wait on stuff just because um, because of the old model tells us that we got to collect these assets and we got to get the team ready and this and that because it always just leads to the same uh, disappointment anyway. 
<laughs> right. Well, you know, talking about Substack, I mean, uh, uh, there are a lot of songwriters on there who are doing just that thing, like Joe Pernice uh, is on yeah. there. And every couple of weeks, uh, I'll get an email from him going, yeah, I got a new song coming out tomorrow that I wrote yesterday or whatever. And yeah, he's great. You subscribe, you get it and yada, yada, yada. So there are ways to approach it. I think so. And for songwriters that um, take, you know, and uh, that are creating something that's worthwhile and meaningful uh i think it's worth it to go out and find those songs and and have a listen and and kind of get into that world a little bit yeah it's okay to it's okay to to not be bashed over the head with something it's okay to 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 slow burn um to take things in slowly i think you know i think that that's kind of there's got to be a revolution of that at some point oh yeah, yeah i hope so i romanticize that all the time I, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody last night. They were asking me questions about, you know, that don't, I can't rem quite remember the context, but it was, it started because they were asking me questions about one-on-one -on -one meetings at music conferences. Oh. And I, and I went, oh, okay, geez. Okay. Well, I'm never any good at those. You know, I don't have, I don't really want to sit there and talk to somebody and say, hey, will you hire me? And then eventually the conversation led to, this fast media consumption. Um, and I, and I said, you know, people in 10, 15, 20 years ago, they, they might've had a hundred CDs or 200 CDs and they would look at their music collection and they would have to choose one of those CDs and they would have to familiarize themselves with it. And so you would sink yourself into a record or a song or whatever you would spend time with it and now you don't spend time with anything you just keep moving on uh, and and half the time like in so in the way that it's consumed now i even find myself listening to something that i love and two weeks later looking at it and going oh yeah that record exists yeah. i completely forgot about it for two weeks but two weeks ago i absolutely loved it yep and that didn't used to happen. And that yeah. it's just, it's a real mindset change. It's a paradigm shift, really. Like, and I, I just don't like it, oh, <laughs> to be honest. It's going to be disheartening for a songwriter to to live in that world, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I suppose it, so. It but it's, a, I suppose so. But there's also people that, you know, make one pair of jeans instead of being Levi's that love what they do and they're okay with selling one thing at a time or. Sure. I think that's the craft of it. And it's like, it's the Nick Lowe thing, you know, it's like, mm. let's listen to, um, or the Guy Clark thing where it's like, it's just more, more it's more handcrafted. And, uh, and I guess you're more of an artisan than a content sure. creator, which is okay. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm not going to be someone who sits around and goes, Oh God, this is sucks because this has changed. I mean, it's, like I said earlier, it's just things hey, change. That's, that's all they do. Um, so how do you, how do you, how do you uh, go with the stream, but in your own boat? Yeah, exactly. Well, you, just, you have to find you just a way have to... with it and, and, and find your own way through the, 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 the times we, we live in, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But I, I think what Leroy what Leroy said that sort of prompted me to speak was that there has to be a revolution at some point on this. Mm -hmm. It has to expire at some point. Something has to give where people lose it all at their the, the, at their fingertips. It is no longer there, and they're fucked for lack of a better term when it comes to what they want to listen to. I hope that happens one day because it'll show us just how special music is. Yeah, how disposable it shouldn't be. You know, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy to me. Like, I always find it incredibly strange how that the SAG Actra can can go on strike and the biggest artists will go st stand on the picket lines so that the the guy in the background of the shot has right. a fair shake or that isn't going to be exploited. But for some reason, musicians, it's just good luck. Yeah, you know? well, yeah, exactly. Well, good there's luck. There's no solid. I'm... There's no solidarity, um, yeah. and uh, 
you know, again, it's it's neither good nor bad. It just is the way it is. But I do find it uh, I do find it a really interesting case study. Well, that's a good. Well, point. I think I think that's a good point for sure. I, I also feel like in the in the music world, there's so many people making music right now. So if you and they could just do it in their bedroom and put it on the internet, and then they want to go play a show, they'll go play a show for next to nothing. So if you know, if it comes down to whether or not they're going to book you or this person who doesn't want anything in return, yeah, <laughs> you you lose the gig a lot of times from because of people who are tr trying to be paid by opportunity. And, you know, it's hard to make a living when your paycheck is opportunities, you know, exactly. it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't really work. Um, yeah. and, and music is definitely something that's taken for granted, but, you know, the other side of that too, is that we're willing participants. We, we do this because we love it. And in a sense, everybody knows that and they're willing to, take advantage of that i guess but yeah, we I still do it every think, time bro? we do it all right guys well listen i think i've taken up enough of your time today <laughs> <laughs> what do you think daryl all right guys time to go <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry i didn't hear that question <laughs> no no it's okay i wasn't uh i wasn't ignoring you no no it's all good all right well listen thanks for the album yeah. Thanks for the time. I hope uh, you guys uh, maybe you could uh, you know come here, meet in Winnipeg, uh, kind sure. of at the distance for you, play yeah. some shows. Yeah, yeah, it's been on Winnipeg's back on my radar again. Um, but thanks for taking the time, Daryl. I'm a f like I mentioned, I'm a fan of what you do, and and um, Me too. thank you. Thanks for keeping the the flame alive. All right. Absolutely. Well, best of luck with everything. We'll we'll see you somewhere down the road. Okay. Take care. Okay. Peace. Okay. Bye.